Okay. Alejandra, do you want to do the um, intros? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Digital Accessibility Liaisons meeting. It's great to have you here. Today's speaker um, is from the nerdery, and I will let them present themselves. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, having us and having this discussion about WCAG 2.2 today. Um, we're so excited to be here. We really appreciate it. We are very passionate about accessibility and we love sharing that with folks. So um, because we have a lot of content to cover with 2.2, uh, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. But yeah, we'll have some intros here in a minute as well. Next. <clears throat> I think, okay, cool. <laughs> Just making sure our presentation thing's working. Um, all right, so here is what our agenda for the next hour is gonna, here's what it's gonna look like. Um, we'll have those brief intros, like I mentioned. Uh, and then we'll have a little overview of digital accessibility that's more general. Um, we know some of you, you know, probably have a good background in it already. So maybe a bit of a refresher for some, but um, Shia will talk more about that. Uh, but we'll spend most of the time today looking at the WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.2 updates, which just came out. Um, and then after we go through all that, we'll have a little summary uh, on what we learned and we'll make sure to leave some time for questions and at the end as well. Uh, we know there's like that second open discussion meeting right after this. Um, so, you know, hopefully there'll be more time for questions or more discussion and hopefully some folks will be able to join there as well. Next. All right, so who are we? Um, well, first of all, Nerdery, I have to give us our company a quick plug. Um, we are a future focused premier consultancy specializing in digital solutions. So we do strategy, design, development, um, and we're focused on providing digital solutions that meet user needs and bring value to your business. Uh, more specifically in terms of accessibility offerings, um, I won't go through, like there's a lot of words on these couple of slides. I won't go through all of that, but um, just kind of give you a high level overview of what these are. Uh, like a, we'll do a initial review, you know, which might be more like a temperature check to get an idea on the overall accessibility health for an app. Um, a full audit would be pretty extensive, you know, with manual testing and logging individual issues. Um, next, planning and design reviews is going to be pretty much like what it says. Um, helping with the, you know, consult before things are turned into code. And then uh, consulting and testing is more referring to various different team members doing the actual accessibility work. And then finally, automated test triage um, is looking at some of those automated test results and going through and verifying like what is or isn't valid. You know, they can throw false positives, et cetera, and prioritizing those things. So that's a bit about um, what Shyla and I and Nerdery does more generally with accessibility. And now we can introduce ourselves. Uh, so I'm Laura Shields. I'm a software engineering manager here. Um, I do engineering work with front end specifically and have always had a focus on accessibility. Um, so along the way here in recent years, I've gotten a couple IAA certifications um, and I've just worked with a lot of different interesting clients over my career with accessibility, including other universities. So um, I really enjoy that work and I'll pass over to Shyla to introduce herself. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. My name is Shyla Earl and I'm an accessibility quality assurance engineer here at Nerdery. Um, and I am a digital accessibility specialist. So like Laura, I also have my CPAC certification. I'm in the process of sitting for my WAS exam. Um, I do accessibility testing, the design re review consultations, the accessibility audits, um, prioritizing accessibility 
issues that we find on um, websites and applications. So I kind of run the gamut of accessibility work here at Nerdery. Um, and some of the accessibility experience that I have is also listed on this website, just in case you're interested in doing a deeper dive on the type of accessibility work that I've done. So now we're just gonna hop into a quick overview of what digital accessibility is. And again, as Laura mentioned, we are very aware of the fact that uh, many of you today are familiar with digital accessibility, you're familiar with the WCAG guidelines. So this is really meant to just be a brief overview to set the foundation for us to be able to talk about the new WCAG 2.2 updates. With that, um, digital accessibility in practice um, means that we're verifying and ensuring that digital products meet or exceed the web content accessibility guidelines, also known as WCAG. Um, the first set of WCAG guidelines were published in 1999, so quite a while ago. Um, it did take about nine years for WCAG 2.0 to be published, which occurred in 2008. And then, um, as most of us know, technology went through a pretty big boom um, between 2008 and 2018 when WCAG 2.1 um, was released. And currently, WCAG 2.1 AA is the standard that we test to to ensure that people are meeting WCAG guidelines. Um, we'll talk a little bit more, or I will talk a little bit more about what the difference between A, double A, and triple A conformance is on the next slide. Um, but really, you know, the, the cool thing about the WCAG guidelines is that they continue to build on one another. So as we publish to, you know, one, well, when 1.0 was published, um, 2.0 built on that, 2.1 built on that, and now the updates we're going to talk about today, WCAG 2.2, um, continue to build on that. And there is currently um, WCAG 3.0 in working draft, although that's not expected to be published um, anytime soon. So I, I heard at the absolute earliest, 2027, um, but if history gives us any information, it'll probably be quite a bit longer than that. So, all right. Um, Laura and I originally had wanted this to be a more interactive um, presentation, but we also realized we do have a lot of content to get through today. So instead of asking who knows what the core principles are, um, I'm just going to quick, quickly go through them, again, assuming that you have that base knowledge. Um, the core principles are what the WIC, what WCAG is, is based on. Um, the first of that being perceivable, the second operable, the third is understandable, and the fourth is robust. And these numbers, as, as Laura will introduce to us in a little bit, um, are actually important. And the new WCAG 2.2 guidelines really are focusing on the operable and the understandable parts of the core principles. Um, so we'll see how that plays into these updates in a little bit. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Kathy added a link in the chat for users. So please um, feel free to go check that out as well. So as I mentioned, um, we currently are testing to WCAG 2.1 AA to um, ensure that digital products are conforming to accessibility standards. Um, so the first level would be single A, that's considered to be the bare minimum, it's a baseline. It makes a, use, a website usable for people with disabilities and for people using different digital technologies um, or assistive technologies, but that doesn't always mean that the, the user experience is great. It's usable, but it's maybe not the best user experience. So then when we move to double A, this is considered to be the international gold standard. So when we are testing to WCAG 2.1 double A, we are um, testing to make sure that ADA regulations are being met. Um, this is also referenced in section 508. And the goal is that by meeting the double A criterion, there should be a decent user experience for the majority of users. And it is important to note that when we're testing to double A, we are including all of the single A criterion in that as well. 
And then for AAA, we, we will talk about AAA today in the new WCAG 2.2 um, updates. I believe we have three um, AAA requirements. So we will be providing examples for that. But it's important to note that AAA really is this highest level of conformance. It's considered to be this impossible perfection. So there are occasions where reaching AAA just isn't possible. But for companies who are concerned about digital accessibility and care about creating the best user experience for all users, um, AAA really is that goal to strive to achieve. Um, because again, AAA does create a good user experience for all users. And again, just to note that AAA is also in, including all of the AA and single A criterion. And now I will pass it off to Laura to dive into some of these new WCAG 2.2 updates. Thank you. Yeah, here's the fun part. <laughs> um, so what happened with 2.2? Uh, like Shyla mentioned, we were waiting for it for quite a while. It was originally uh, supposed to be released sooner, but it finally got published last month. Um, you can go ahead and go next slide. And so uh, what actually happened when it came out, we got nine new success criteria. And it actually removed one prior success criteria, um, which I don't think that had happened before this was the first time. Um, so most of the time, like Shiloh mentioned, it's just building on top of the previous ones. Um, so we won't really spend time on that removed one. Uh, Y'all can look into more details if you wanna look up 4.1.1 parsing to understand that one. Um, but we're going to focus on the nine new ones today. Um, two of those were single A, four were double A, and three were triple A. Next. All right. So let's uh, take a look at the list here. First one is 2.4.11, focus not obscured, minimum double A. And then we have 2.4.12, focus not obscured, enhanced triple A. Um, there's a couple of criteria like this, where there's a minimum and an enhanced version, minimum being the double A and enhanced being the triple A. Um, so that's the first set. Uh, next, we have 2.4.13, focus appearance, and that's a triple A. Um, there are, the, for those of you who are familiar with the WCAG guidelines already, there are other guidelines dealing with focus state already. Um, so this is a more specific guideline around focus appearance. Uh, 2.5.7 has to do with dragging movements. That's a double A. 2.5.8 is target size minimum, double A. Uh, 3.2.6, consistent help, and that's a single A. 3.3.7, redundant entry, single A. Uh, and then the last couple we have is another pair of minimum and enhanced. 3.3.8 is accessible authentication minimum, double A. 3.3.9, accessible authentication enhanced, triple A. <laughs> kind of a mouthful, but um, as Shiloh mentioned, you know, if you look at this list, if you look at those numbers that we're seeing, um, that poor P-O-U-R, one, two, three, four matchup, you know, uh, roughly half of these new criterion are focused on the operable, the O, um, starting with the two dot whatevers, and then the others are focused around operable, um, or I'm sorry, understandable, uh, the three dot whatevers. Um, and then those, the next middle number after the two or the three, uh, I don't know if, you know, probably not that many people would have those memorized, but those are subsections within those poor principles. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, each of the subsections when we go through, but just for reference, that that's why there's all those numbers. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to have pass back over to Shyla uh, so she could go over the first section with y'all. Thank you, Laura. So yes, we will be looking at um, updates for the section of operable and subsection of navigatable um, under the operable principle. And really the idea is that um, this provides ways to help users navigate the website to find content and to determine where they are 
um, on the screen. So we're going to be focusing a lot on focus appearance. Um, so the first WCAG guideline we're going to discuss is 2.4.11, focus not obscured minimum. And the idea is that when a user interface component receives keyboard focus, so a user is using tab to navigate through the screen, um, the component that they're on is not entirely hidden um, due to author con created content. So the example I'm going to show is from a carousel, but um, other examples to keep in mind with this WCAG um, success criteria are things like sticky footers, sticky headers, um, non-modal dialogues, uh, even like cookie consent banners, things like that, that maybe pop up on a website. And the idea with this guideline is so long as the users are able to dismiss that content prior to getting to the page where the focus state is at, um, then this rule is not being violated. But if they are not able to get to that content and that focus state is not visible to users, then that would be an example of um, a failure of this accessibility criterion. So here are those examples. Again, we have this black outline around this thumbnail. And we do see that it is obscured. The element itself is obscured, but it's not completely obscured. And so for um, 2.4.1, this, this example will pass that success criterion. And same thing here, we have the focus state, again, partially obscured um, by this carousel advance, advancement button but also you know, cut off on the side, which is a pretty common pattern that we see. It's indicating to users that, hey, there's more content. You can either click on the thumbnail itself or you can um, navigate with this carousel advance button. Um, but we're letting you know your focus is on this element. Um, and again, even though we're, we don't see the entire parameter of this focus state, um, to meet 2.4.1, these both of these examples are fine because the element is not completely obscured by other content. However, when we move to 2.4.12, focus not obscured, enhanced. Again, this is a triple A um, conformance level success criterion. So this is not um, necessarily required to meet uh, accessibility standards, but it's one of those goals that we can achieve to if we want. The difference between this enhanced criterion versus the minimum criterion is that no part of the focused element would be obscured by other content. So we're going to use those same examples um, that we did in the last slide to see, OK, well, now we have this um, thumbnail in the carousel that is, we can see that it's focused, but there is an element that is obscuring it, so that would in fact, then um, not pass this success criterion. So again, just to give some examples of the difference between a double A criteria and a triple A criteria and those minimum and enhanced um, versions of similar rules. The last um, focus state WCAG 2.2 update that we have is 2.4.13 focus appearance. Again, this is a triple A. And this rule is actually pretty interesting. In the drafts, in the, the working drafts, um, there were a lot of different um, and pretty specific criteria that people would need to meet to establish um, focus appearance. And what we're seeing with these new published WCAG guidelines is that that range of options was really kind of condensed into we need to make sure that that focus state is meeting a specific size. So we have a focus state that encompasses the entire parameter of the um, interactive element. And then we need to make sure that appropriate color contrast is being met. So they really simplified this, um, the requirements for the success criterion, and they made it a triple A instead of a double A. Um, because they recognize that this can be a much more complex and sometimes difficult um, success criterion to meet. So I did pull a couple of examples. We can see um, in this first example, the learn more button 
we have the, and I suppose I should give you the size and <laughs> color contrast requirements. The size requirements is that the parameter around the entire interactive element is two pixels thick. So we can see here that yes, in fact, we have a, a focus state that's two pixels thick, and then it meets that minimum color contrast, which is three um, to one contrast ratio. Uh, once we move down to the second button, there are a couple of reasons why this button is failing and they're related to color contrast. You can sort of see there's a black um, outline here along with this white outline. So we're definitely meeting that two pixels around the entire parameter um, portion of the success criteria. But we need to mate, meet that three to one color contrast ratio between the unfocused state and the focused state. The unfocused state is this yellow with this back, back, black background. And while we can you know, see that there really isn't much color contrast at all with the black focus state on that black background, so we're definitely not meeting that three to one contrast, I did go and test the white to the yellow, and that also does not meet the three to one contrast. So it's not meeting the contrast against the unfocused state, which again is that yellow, but it's not meeting the contrast while it's in a focus state either. So this um, example does fail the um, 2.4.13 focus appearance because it's not meeting that color contrast minimum. And then we can see with this second example, you know, the color contrast, that black on white, we're definitely meeting the three to one color contrast ratio, but we are missing this one portion of the parameter. And with this um, new guideline, it is asking that we completely encompass the entire element with that two pixel um, focus state. So that would be a reason why this um, would not pass this guideline. And I think this is actually a really great place to mention too that, you know, we recognize the WCAG 2.2 guidelines have just been published in October. There's no expectation um, of any website at this point meeting all of the new um, WCAG 2.2 updates, especially um, the AAA compliance level. So I don't want anyone to feel nervous or feel like, you know, you need to go and fix anything right away. That's that's not the point of this. It's more just to give you some visual ideas of what these new WICA guidelines are asking for. And with that, I will pass on over to Laura. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're on to the 2.5.5. X uh, criterions. Uh, so those are operable input modalities. According to WCAG, these are SC that make it easier for users to operate functionality through various inputs beyond keyboard. Um, so the first one that we have here, next, thank you, uh, is 2.5.7 dragging, which is a double A. So this is one we want to pay more attention to. Um, now, Dragging uh, in this definition is all functionality that uses a dragging movement for operation must also be achieved by a single pointer without dragging unless dragging is essential. Um, so just to clarify, this rule, this new rule is specific to pointer inputs um, like a mouse and not keyboard because there's actually you know a couple different WCAG guidelines out there already for keyboard interactions um, and making sure that those are accessible. There's 2.1.1 keyboard. There's also 2.1.3 keyboard, no, except, no exception. So um, there's a couple that already deal with like dragging in terms of keyboard interaction, um, but this one is with clicking versus dragging kind of thing. Um, so it's asking us to avoid dragging completely or just provide an alternative method to do the same thing that involves a, a single tap or click. Um, so uh, I just want to take at least one, you know, for at least one of these slides, take a minute um, to ask folks to participate a little bit and think about um, in the case of dragging, 
uh, what kinds of challenges might some users be facing uh, with dragging? Like what kind of users would benefit from not having to do dragging uh, interactions? Um, and you can just pop in the, the chat window here or um, unmute yourself and shout out if you want as well to, we'll give folks a minute, but um, yeah, who, who would really benefit from this new criterion? I see uh, Renee, I believe, um, limited range. Yeah, so mobility um, or dexterity kind of issues. Yeah, Kathy noted Parkinson's. That's a big one for sure. Ambulatory challenges, right? Um, awesome. Anybody else want to throw anything out there? Yeah, just learning to use a mouse. That is definitely a thing. Um, I can confirm that I have worked with people who had never used a mouse before in my, in the past. So um, yeah, sometimes you either don't want to use, you know, users might not want to use a mouse or they can't use a mouse. You know, if you're missing a limb, you might not be able to a couple limbs. Um, but yeah, other times it could be like a power user thing where they prefer keyboard over mouse or something like that. So um, yeah, thanks for throwing some answers in there. Uh, so yeah, this rule is really going to help those folks out. Um, let's look at the next slide in there. Oops, sorry, I lost my spot over here. Okay, um, so what kind of UI elements deal with dragging specifically? Like, what can we watch out for? Uh, one example is sliders. So the bottom left image there is like a volume slider, range slider. Um, those are you know pretty common types. Um, those, you know, the, the rule is basically saying that you can have a slider and, you know, in this case, and you can drag with it, but you should also be able to do a single tap or point or click on the slider to change the level, you know, in, in addition to that. Um, and in the case of like a native HTML input with a type of range, it already has that functionality built in. Um, you all might know this already, but we see pretty typically native elements are going to be natively accessible, usually. And so if you're just um, harnessing that and utilizing what's already there, you know, you get that functionality for free <laughs> and you don't have to do any fancy JavaScript or anything. Um, so that's great, you know, and of course, those native elements usually have the keyboard functionality built in too. So in the case of a slider, if you're focused on that element and you use your arrow keys, it's also going to be able to, you know, change the level or like type in a number potentially, you know, change the level for you. So, um, so that's uh, the first example. The other example we dropped in here, and I know it's kind of small on the screen. Hopefully, you can tell what it's showing. Uh, it's like one of those forms where you have uh, sort of a multi-select thing going on. You have lists on the left, and then you can move selected items from that, th those lists over to your, you know, filtered list on the right. Um, and so, you know, maybe this is for generating a report or some kind of directory form or whatever, but, um, this is an interaction example that doesn't utilize dragging at all. It could, again, you know, this UI could have included a draggable area to drag items from the left to the right, in addition to the having buttons that allow us to move items back and forth. Um, but in this case, it doesn't utilize dragging, but users can use both keyboard or single pointer click, tap click, you know, tap motion to move the items from one spot to another. Okay, um, our next criterion is 2.5.8, target size minimum, and that's a double A, another one we wanna pay attention to. Uh, this one is saying that we want an area, we want a target area, uh, so like a focusable, you know, interactive element to have an area of at least 24 by 24, except, and then there's a whole list of exceptions, um, which there's quite a few, actually, we'll go through a few of these in more detail here too. Um, so, you know, at the simplest level, you could just take a, a button or whatever and make sure it's 24 by 24. 
Um, but, you know, again, as Shaila mentioned, understanding that there's a lot of situations where that might not make sense for your UI, um, there are these exceptions. Uh, spacing is the first one having to do with undersized targets. So if it's less than 24 by 24, um, also knowing that not all targets are going to be like a perfect square or a perfect circle. Sometimes they're shapes, right? So if they are not exactly 24 by 24, um, you should be able to put a dot, you know, in the set in what is considered the center of the bounding box for that target. And BCAG actually has demonstrations like graphics of what that might look like. Um, we can link you to that if you want to see it. Uh, but yeah, you should be able to draw a 24 pixel circle, you know, in diameter out from, so 12 uh, pixels, I guess, yeah, on each <laughs> uh, radius from that 24 pixel diameter out from the center. And then it shouldn't be touching any other target or overlapping um, like another target's imaginary circle. So that one can be kind of confusing, but that's more or less what it's saying. We'll look at that one on the next slide in a second. Um, equivalent is just saying, you know, you can make an exception if you can achieve this through a different control on the same page. Inline is pretty straightforward. If it's part of a sentence or constrained by line height, it doesn't have to be exactly, you know, 24 pixel. Um, user agent control is if the size of the target is determined by the user agent. And then essential um, is when a particular presentation of the target is essential to the information being conveyed. We'll show an example of that on one of these slides too. Uh, next slide. So that spacing one, just to give you a little bit more of a visual there. Um, the top left, you know, they show these buttons, these targets that are all 24 by 24. That's nice and simple and easy. But the one below it also passes um, and it shows, you know, what is basically smaller targets with more space between them so that the targets still have 24 pixels of space between them and the next target. Um, so what that kind of like one example of what that might look like is, you know, in the top left example, maybe the image actually has padding around it that's part of that button or link. Um, so if you were to focus, keyboard focus on it, you know, you'd see like that white space around it. Um, but on the image right below it, where the target sizes are only 20 pixel, you know, that maybe focusable area is smaller. And then there's white space that's not part of the focusable area but that's enough space to count for the, the guideline here. Um, and then the example below it on the left there is a fail because the target is smaller than 20, you know, an undersized target smaller than 20 pixel, and it doesn't have that extra space. So if I drew a bunch of circles, like it shows on the right side um, on the bottom there, if we draw a bunch of circles out from the center of those, they're gonna intersect. So that's why that one is a fail. Um, also, as a quick note, if any of you are, you know, big design folks, if you're familiar with the human interface guidelines that Apple made when the iPhone came out on like good mobile design, um, that HIG recommended touch targets for mobile devices of 44 by 44 pixels. So for folks who have been following the HIG all along, on for their mobile designs. Um, this is probably already passing with flying colors since it's only requiring 24 pixels. <laughs> but um, all right, we'll move on to another exception, which is um, inline. Uh, again, pretty straightforward here. I just grabbed an example from the WCAG spec that shows a sentence with a link in it. And that link is 173 by 18 pixels. So it's more than 24 in one direction, but it's less than 24 in another. Um, but that's okay because it is in line within the sentence there. And our last exception is essential. Um, so maps really demonstrate essential exceptions 
because the placement of the touch targets, in this case, the, the little map pins for locations, is essential to the information being conveyed. Um, we have to have these pins in the places that they're in, which is less than 24 pixels. You know, it's overlapping in some cases or very close to, to each other. We have to put them there for geographic accuracy. And that's, you know, just kind of how it is. Hopefully there's some functionality like zooming that lets us space those things out a little more as needed. But, um, but yeah, that is considered an exception too. Uh, okay, last slide on this target size minimum. Uh, again, a couple ASU examples. Um, so we grabbed these uh, from a couple of different little like form sections um, using the axe extension for reference. Um, now, just so you know that currently the axe extension doesn't include in like the free version, it doesn't include 2.2 yet. Um, that should be coming in the future, hopefully soon. But right now it is like a, a paid or subscription feature in order to put 2.2 on there. It only does 2.1 right now. Um, but yeah, so we you know had uh, these screenshots highlighted from that scan. And you can see there's like a button in each one highlighted in pink. Uh, the little eyeball button for password on the left and then the radio uh, input on the right. And, you know, in each, it's sort of highlighting that these targets are smaller than 24 by 24 pixels. Well, like we just talked about, if there's, a, you know, if you can draw in, in an undersized target situation, if you can draw a circle out from that that has 24 pixels of space, and doesn't overlap another target, you should be okay. So these might be okay, you know, as they are already meeting the criteria. But X calls these things out because it's not entirely sure, you know. And so it's it's like, hey, you should take a look at this to make sure. Um, and even if it is already meeting the criteria, it could be an opportunity just to look into places where touch targets could be made a little bit bigger to be closer to that 24 by 24 pixel recommendation. Um, it's just a little simpler that way, right? Where you, it won't even call it out, you know, as a flagged item if it's if it's 24 by 24 to begin with, so. Cool, all right, uh, we got through that section. I'm gonna pass back over to Shyla. All right, thanks, Laura. So we're gonna move along in the poor principles. We're moving from understand or from operable to understandable. And we're looking at the subcategory of predictable, which essentially is asking that web pages appear and operate in predictable ways um, to make it more user friendly for all users and to support users with cognitive disabilities. So the first Guideline we're going to talk about is 3.2.6, consistent help. This is one of the single A um, conformance success criteria. And so we do want to make sure that this is happening. Um, what this is asking us to do is to make sure that if there are help mechanisms repeated across multiple web pages on a website, that those help mechanisms occur in the same relative order and can be found in the same relative place um, on the page. So that when users are looking for those help details, they know where to easily locate them on each page of a website. So some examples of this would be human contact details, a human contact mechanism, self-help self options like an FAQ page, um, or a fully automated contact mechanism. And we'll look at these in a little bit more um, depth in the next few slides. So again, pulling in an example from ASU's website, this is the footer that can be found. It's the global footer that can be found on all of the pages. And there is this um, contact ASU page. There's a link to the page where all of those, um, the contact mechanisms that were talking about can be found um, in one place. So it makes it really easy for users to find help um, or to, to figure out information that they need to find out. So um, this is the, the Contact Us page from ASU's website. You can see there's a live chat here. There are the 
there's the human contact information, like a phone number, um, customer service email, all of that stuff. So again, just very concise, all located in one place. And it's easily easy to find um, because there's that contact ASU link in the footer on every page. So to do a little bit deeper dive, again, human contact details are things like phone number, email, physical address, and also the hours of operation. So all of this information, again, is on that Contact Us page. Uh, there was the human contact mechanism, so a live chat. Um, I actually went through and used this feature. So when I clicked on the button, uh, another window opened up and it gave me the opportunity to enter an information and chat with someone. Um, so any questions that I had could be answered. There's also the FAQ page, which has quite a, an extensive filter options. I couldn't take a full screenshot and, and fit it on the slide, but there's a lot of filters. There's a search bar. So again, users can go in and find this FAQ page through the Contact Us page. So consistent, easy to use, easy to find. And then um, there wasn't an example of a fully automated um, chat mechan or contact mechanism, like a chat bot or something like that on ASU's website. So we pulled um, a chat feature from another website just to give you a visual representation of what that looks like. But for example, you know, if, if someone has a chat bot on their site, let's say it's located in the bottom right corner of the home page. We would want to see that located on the bottom right corner of other important landing pages throughout the site so that users could consistently um, identify where to access that chatbot and ask for help. And then Laura, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, on to the 3.3's understandable input assistance. Um, our first one we'll look at here is 3.3.7 uh, redundant entry, and that's a single A. Um, so that's you know something that would also be covered with double A. That one is information previously entered by or provided to the user that is required to be entered again in the same process is either auto-populated or available for the user to select with several allowable exceptions. Exceptions, once again. <laughs> uh, next. So those exceptions include re-entering the, uh, the information being essential. Um, so, you know, that might be like them asking you to enter a password in two times um, to verify, you know, that you typed in the right thing the first time. Uh, the information is required to ensure the security of the content and previously entered information is no longer valid. So those are a few exceptions there. Um, on the next slide, we'll show a visual example here, yeah, of what redundant entry actually looks like. This is probably, I'm guessing like, you know, we can't really show of hands here, but like, out of the number of people in this room who have seen a pattern like this where you fill out uh, a shipping address or a billing address, you know, whichever, and then you get to fill it out the other one and you get a checkbox maybe to just pre-populate all of that content in those same exact address fields again. Um, it's probably everyone here has seen this. Um, and so that is an example that would meet redundant entry um, and is you know probably already being done in a lot of cases. Um, all right, so 3.3.8, sorry, accessible authentication minimum, double A. Um, this is saying that a cognitive function test is not required for any step in an authentication process unless specific criteria are met. Um, so we're going to go through that criteria uh, here on the next slide. Um, there's kind of a lot, but you basically are allowed to require a cognitive test if at least one of these four options is true. The first one is alternative. So if you have an alternative method that's available that doesn't rely on a cognitive function test, that's one way, which is kind of funny because it's saying you can have a test if you have an alternative that doesn't have a test, <laughs> but that is what it, what the rule is. 
Number two is if a mechanism is available to assist the user in completing the test. Three, uh, here, ab object recognition, if the cognitive test uh, function test is to recognize objects. We'll see an example of that in a minute. Or um, personal content. If the cognitive function test is to identify non-text content the user provided to the website. Um, and I, I didn't grab an example of this, but I'm pretty sure this would be like, you know, uh, one of those tests that says, you know, here's a bunch of different images. Um, pick from one of these images. And the next time you log in, we're going to ask you which of the images you picked to make sure that, you know, it's really you. Like, tell me something only you know <laughs> kind of thing. So, uh, all right. So I put a couple of examples here of how you can meet this requirement. Um, example one is allowing copy and paste to reduce the cognitive burden of retyping. So, you know, by making your uh, your form fields marked up appropriately and not preventing copy and paste, this helps a user, you know, to meet this requirement. Um, example two, ooh, we got a number one still on there. Example two is support for password entry by password managers to reduce memory need. So again, not trying to block users from being able to use this assistive tools that, you know, helps with these kind of things because passwords are hard. <laughs> so making sure they have access to those. Um, actually, uh, I was looking up some, some stuff related to this and found out that like the autocomplete Boolean, um, which you can apply to a bunch of different types of input, native input fields. Uh, if it has values like on and off, uh, you know, I think are the main ones. Um, if you turn that off, I believe it's still, it looked like it still will allow password. The browser will still allow password managers, you know, to do their thing, even if you have disabled um, autocomplete on that particular field. So that's good. The browser kind of helps support that as well. All right. And then the last example here um, is, uh, like we mentioned, that object rep recognition. And so in this case, we're showing an image of a CAPTCHA that is asking us to select images of crosswalks. Um, you know, so that's a common example you probably see that would pass this um, authentication as well. All right, now we're gonna look at 3.8 uh, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, one more example, the failure. Uh, if you remember in the previous um, slide, we mentioned that you can't require, like it should be non-text that we're asking users, you know, uh, not all users are gonna have English or whatever language they're looking at as the native language, right? So um, this test that uses letters would be a fail. We don't want to do that. Okay, so I know we're getting close on time here. Um, so we're going to blast through this. This is the very last rule that we have to look at here. Uh, the enhanced version for authentication, the triple A1. Um, it is very similar to the previous rule, except with the difference being um, those uh, exceptions that we looked at have a more limited list. So it's saying it's not required unless there is either an alternative method without a required cognitive test or there's a mechanism. Um, so next slide, if we remember, we had that list of four uh, sort of exceptions for a cognitive, you know, including a cognitive test um, or requirements for including a cognitive test, we had object recognition and personal content previously in the list, those are no longer an option for enhanced. It has to be either alternative or mechanism. So it's more strict basically. Um, and then next, so one example of meeting this criteria would be a website that uses passkey technology, which is a big thing right now, um, such as web auth n. So this, these are things that let you log in without using a username and password. 
Um, that could include a fingerprint scan, a face, a face ID, face scan, a pin number, um, a variety of different things, but it is not requiring username and password specifically. Uh, next example include would be logging in with a third party provider um, using SSO such as OAuth. So, you know, like using a, a Google login or a Microsoft login or something like that would work for this as well. And the last example here is a website that requires two factor authentication displaying a QR code, which can be scanned by an app on a user's device to confirm their identity. So there's a there's actually a whole list of additional examples on the WCAG, like understanding this WCAG guideline, if you look up 3.3.9, um, that'll go into more details if you're curious and wanna read more about those different things. All right, I'm gonna pass back to Shyla to summer, sum that all up. All right, and I uh, recognize that we have about eight minutes left, so I'm just going to zip through these last two slides, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So to summarize, our new nine new success criteria in WCAG 2.2 is um, some focus state and focus appearance guidelines, focus not obscured, so focus can be partially obscured, um, focus not obscured enhanced, so the focus can't be obscured at all. Focus appearance, we wanna make sure that we have a two pixel thick parameter around the interactive element that meets three to one contrast. Dragging, either not having dragging elements or allowing users to have a single point or tap um, to create the same experience. Target size, making sure that the targets are 24 by 24 pixels large. Um, consistent help, having a way for users to consistently identify across a website how they can find help. Redundant entry, not requiring users to refill information over and over and over again, except under certain exceptions, uh, which are outlined in these slides, which we will make available to you. And then the last two, accessible authentication minimum, which asks that for one of four conditions are met if a cognitive test is required, and then accessible authentication enhanced, which is asking that one of two conditions are met if a cognitive test is required. And with that, we have about six minutes for Q&A, so I'm gonna open up the floor, and both Laura and I are here um, to address your question. So we're looking forward to it. Yeah, again, I think um, you can either post like in the chat or watching that, or if you wanna just unmute and jump in, I'm sure that's fine too. There's not too, too many people here. I'm wondering about touch target size. Do you think um, that's going to be in um, automated accessibility testers or, you know, the checkers? Or do you think, like, they can kind of look at the CSS, I think. But, I mean, a lot of times it could just be an image that doesn't have a width or a height on it. Yeah, it definitely it is in the automated test because we, like you saw those couple examples from uh, ASU, those little, like the radio button and the eyeball button. Um, that was from an automated checker from Axe uh, saying, hey, this button isn't 24 by 24. So, um, but it could be a false positive. You know, again, you have to evaluate those results um, or a false negative <laughs> um, to to say, hey, well, it's, it's not 25 by 24, but it, since it's an undersized target and it I can draw a 24 pixel circle out from the center that doesn't touch another target's 24 pixel circle, it's okay. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Do you know if Wave is, is able to test yet for this? Uh, I, I don't off the top of my head. I also wonder, does Wave, does anyone know if Wave uses Axe under the hood? A lot of uh, automated accessibility does use Axe under the hood. <laughs> I don't know if it does. Yeah, it'd be a good I question. I don't know if it look. does either. I, I, my understanding is that they built it from the ground up. Yeah. They that they didn't, you know, 
piece it together or use or use anything else. That's my understanding, but I, I don't know. I'm also yeah. being recorded, so I don't want to be wrong either. So I apologize if I'm wrong. <laughs> No, that's fine. Yeah, like I know, for example, Lighthouse uses Axe under the hood, but it's not exactly the same as um, the, you know, the Axe extension itself. Um, and so there there are some, even the ones that use Axe, it might not work exactly the same as the actual Axe one. I think Axe is really good for people who are already using develop the developer tools in Chrome. Um, for them, they're already in there, so why not use Axe? But for a lot of people, if you're if you're not a developer, um, yeah, I think Wave is is. I actually I tested Wave's at, uh, their ex browser extension with against um, the Site Improve browser extension, and found that um, Site Improve was a little more accurate. And it also caught a few more things, um, but it also had more um, uh, false positives because they're willing to, to flag more things where I know Wave is very careful to, that's one of their, that's one of the big things about Wave is they don't want to give you false positives. But either one of them is a good tool to use. Um, it'll give you a lot of information. And with most automated accessibility tools, we're identifying about 20 to 50% of accessibility issues. So that, that is something to keep in mind just as we're talking about using automated accessibility tools is it gives us, you know, sort of like those accessibility audits that Laura was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. It gives us a good health check to understand sort of where we're starting at with a website's accessibility health, but there are going to be manual tests or dynamically generated accessibility features that won't be able to be picked up from automated tools. Right. If you, things like um, keyboard only access testing, where you test just with your keyboard and not, don't use your mouse, and um, also um, with screen readers. If you guys, if you need to know how to do that, there's a, um, a workshop we we uh, there's a recording of the workshop um and it should be listed under testing on the ex a, um the accessibility site so go ahead and, and view that that workshop uh kathy there's one question in the chat and then um and then we should probably close out because we have a minute left i'm sorry david i hope we can get to it uh his question is for or maybe it's a comment for the draggable requirements it says unless it is required i'm curious what would count as a, as required? It seems like it could be a bit subjective. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind might be like an application where you're working with graphics, you know, like a Photoshop type of thing. And maybe like in order to create a certain, you know, illustration or whatever, like you have to drag that shape in some way. Um, I don't know if that's a good example or not. That's just kind of what comes to my mind is that might be like an essential, you know, uh, something that is difficult to achieve otherwise. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ted and Laura. I really appreciate your time and your extensive knowledge. Lynn, you as well. Um, thank you so much to Nerdery for, for letting you come on over and, and giving us this wonderful presentation. Uh, please stay for the next half an hour if you've got more in-depth questions for, for the team and, and or if you've got just questions in general about accessibility, we're here to help. So uh, thanks so much and have a great afternoon and feel welcome again to stay. Thank you. Bye, we'll everybody. see you guys in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anybody who's still here, um, we will not be meeting in December. So we'll send out a note about that too, but just know we're not meeting next month. Yep. Yeah, not meeting. Forgot to mention that. We can also post that in our Slack channel. I'm going to stop the recording. That's all right. Yes, please. I can probably stop.